Hello, happy Tuesday. It is only Tuesday. I almost said Thursday. Um, I'm super excited today. We're going to be talking with Katya from Boho Speechy about natural language acquisition, just all language processing. Um, I'm super excited. So as soon as I see her hop on here, I'm going to add her. Let's see what we got here. I don't know if anyone's like me. I am so tired today, but I'm like super, super pumped for this live. Hello, everyone who's coming in. Let's see, I see Katya. There we go. It worked. Hi. Hey. I was like, you look so good. I was like, I was looking for my ring light and then my dog chewed through the cord. <laughs> I so have no ring light, light today. <laughs> but I don't have a stand, so I'm gonna be, ooh. I'll try to keep it steady. It's all good. You should see my mind's just propped up on. A okay, bench. I'll probably end up. So, <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah, it's essentially, I have like stacks of things like this, and it's just leaning on top of a big stack of stuff. So nothing. Can. But hey, I am so glad when I get to like talk to people in real life, because I feel like we see each other on stories. So I feel like we're friends, but we only talk through like DMs and comments sometimes. So when I get to do things like this, like it makes me so pumped. <laughs> yeah, I love that you do this. It's super cool. I've gotten to know, feel like I know more uh, SLPs through your lives. So it's really cool. Well, hey, I hope lots of people can get to know you. I think people probably reach out to you. And you probably have conversations with a million people. So a lot of the people that are here probably already know you and have had conversations with you and are just here because they're like, we need more. So. <laughs> And I'm excited. So in case anyone is new to lives that I do, I was just telling this to Katya. I literally sit here and these are like professional, casual professional discussions where I would probably just sit and FaceTime you and listen to you talk about things that you love all the time. But I figure if it's going to be helpful, why not make it live? Yeah. <laughs> so everyone can benefit. That. So that's kind of what it is today. Pretty casual. And usually when I have topics to talk about, I it's pretty 50 50. Like I have a lot to contribute today. Not so much. So I'm excited to like sit back and be more of a learner. Awesome. And let you do lots of chatting. All right. I'm up for it for sure. Well, let's see. I don't know. I bet a lot of people have come over here from your page, but maybe not. So I'm gonna let you give yourself just a tiny introduction. And then I'll give a little blurb about who I am. Sure. Hi, I'm Katya. Um, I'm pretty new to the field. I just got my C's like last week. So um, yeah, but I work in a special needs school. So most of my students um, I have a lot of gestalt processors and um, a lot of students with intellectual disabilities and Down syndrome. Um, so that's been really fun this year. Last year, I worked with a lot more um, autistic students and then before that I did ABA therapy and that's what kind of got me into the field. Um, my views have changed about that but we won't get into that. Um, <laughs> I share about it on my page but um, yeah I don't know that's a little bit about me. I live in Sacramento, California with my fiance and my dog. Yeah and I originally grew up in Minnesota so Midwest gal at heart but. That I didn't know. How did I not know that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't I guess I don't share it much, but yeah. Hey, learning new things. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll get to know more about you and your passions and things you love as we talk today. So yeah. And in case you don't already know, she is also her Instagram handle is Boho Speechy. I think a lot of people probably already know that. But just in case anyone is here that doesn't already follow you, that's where to go. Go follow her. Thanks. Um, and then in case anyone doesn't know me, I'm Kelly Knight. My Instagram handle is Knight Therapy, and I literally just sit here and like to talk all things SLP with all my SLP friends. So <laughs> I'm school-based and largely talk about things like narrative language intervention, but obviously you can find me here talking to clinicians about anything that I think will be helpful and interesting. So I'm excited for today. Okay. Awesome. I guess probably the easiest way to start this conversation, since some people might not even know. So the overall thing that we were going to talk about today is like gestalt language processing, natural language acquisition. I mean, it's all interrelated, but some people may not even know what that is. Yeah. Can you give a nice little summary 
of what it is we're even going to chat about today. Yeah. So Gestalt language processing, um, students who are Gestalt processors, as we can call them, are students who use echolalia or what some people call scripting uh, to communicate. So these are students who are using these long um, scripts or Gestalts um, that you might that might be from TV shows or just from something they heard someone say or movies or songs. Um, uh, so usually these students are pretty easy to, to pick out, especially if they're in the initial stages of what we call natural language acquisition, which is a process of therapy that was, the name was coined by Marge Blanc and she developed it. Um, so it's just a method of working with these gestalt processes, processors or kids who use echolalia um, to help them get from echolalia to more self-generated language. So there's six major steps to that process. Um, but yeah, and I've, I've been in cahoots chatting with uh, Marge Blanc and getting her um, and help with a lot of things. So that's been really awesome. Um, so I'll probably refer to her and her book and um, her Facebook group a lot, as well as um, Alexandria Zachos, I think is how you pronounce her name, at Meaningful Speech, who shares a lot about um, this stuff as well. I was gonna say, yes, here we love dropping names, resources, anything, so. Awesome. Perfect, perfect. And I guess before we even keep going, I forgot because I was just getting so excited. I always give disclaimers at the beginning of my lives that these are casual professional discussions, but we're just sharing things that we know. We're sharing things that between our research, between our experience, things that have been helpful to us and our clients. But anyone who's listening, I just remind everyone that we all have our personal clinical responsibility for taking information and deciding if it is applicable to you know, our caseloads or not and or to continue in our own study. So... I forgot to make that disclaimer, and if you want to add anything, you can, but just wa washing our hands here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say similar that I'm definitely not an expert in gestalt processing or the natural language acquisition um, process. I've really dove into it this past year and feel confident in it, but um, if there's questions that I don't feel confident um, in, I will refer to the Facebook group that Marge Blanc, the creator of it, um, runs. So, and she answers all the questions in there, so it's a really great resource. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm learning along with you guys. So. Perfect, yeah, we're all open books learning here, so. Yep. People have questions. We have a bunch of questions that between your page and my page we've compiled that can help probably guide this discussion, which I don't even care which way it goes. But if people are here listening live and you have any comments or questions, drop it because we would love to see and hear it. Yeah. Okay. How should we tackle this? Do you just want to start knocking out some questions and pinballing? <laughs> Sure, I guess I can do one of mine and then you can ask me one that I'm, that you have on yours. Perfect. Um, so right off the bat, someone asked me about goals and I've been getting a lot of questions about goals um, when it comes to these students. And I, I have questions about goals as well because it's hard to find um, information. <laughs> Sorry, my dog. <laughs> uh, I'll probably hear my dog this whole time. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna sh shut my window so you can't see anybody to bark at. <laughs> I totally understand that. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm still learning about how to write goals as well, because um, there isn't a lot of information even in um, Marge's book or the courses so far on exactly like these are what goals are supposed to look like. But I got a lot of information from the Facebook group, Natural Language Acquisition Study Group, I think is the name um, that Marge runs. But basically, um, for stage one, which is when students are using um, whole complete gestalts. So, exact copies of something they heard um, from a movie or um, someone saying something or whatever, These, those whole gestalts that aren't yet broken apart at all, um, 
the main goal for that stage is to get them to say more of those and or more mitigable um, gestalts. So instead of saying um, phrases from a TV show, for example, that might be hard to break apart, we want to model for them more mitigable phrases. So that means a phrase that can be turned in, into a lot of um, different other phrases. And that's why I'll share um, that you should be modeling phrases that start with let's or it's or I'm or we're because then you can, for example, if I modeled let's go to the park, that could change to let's go outside, let's get lunch, let's get a toy. Um, just to give an example of how that um, mitigable um, phrase works. So um, in stage one, I would say a goal could be student will produce blank number of new mitigable gestalts because they might have very few mitigable gestalts. So just increasing that number and you can decide that number based on your student and how fast you think they're gonna progress. Um, we also want to look at variety of gestalt. So before they can move into stage two, which is where we're breaking apart and mix and matching these gestalts, they need a big variety. So that means communicative functions. Are they, do they have gestalts for requesting and commenting and um, transitioning, like saying, what's next? Um, all of those big uh, communicative functions, you, I think there's there's at least like eight to 10 that we are, want to look at. And I just made a post about this, so I'll, I'll share more about that. But um, we, want, we want to hit all those before we move to stage two. So you could write a goal saying, student will produce mitigable gestalts um, to comment, blah, 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 comment, request. Um, you get the point. So either increasing the number of gestalts or the variety um, for stage one is what I try to focus on. Um, and then stage two is when we're mixing and matching. So I, um, I would word it as student will produce, will combine previously used gestalts to create maybe a certain number of new gestalts. So basically as long as you're wording it as they're gonna use previously used gestalts to mix and match or however you wanna um, phrase that to produce new um, gestalts. Um, and then another goal for stage two could be that they will um, produce stage two gestalts. So mitigations of original gestalts at least 50% of the time. Um, so oftentimes I'll use those like percent markers. They're using this stage a certain percent of time. Um, I won't get into the other stages because they're just really complex. But I, I wrote a um, a couple of posts about goals so I can share those to my page as well but I would definitely recommend looking into the the Facebook group um, if you have goal questions and just looking in the history and searching goals and there's a lot of stuff there that people have chatted about um, so it's super helpful. Thank you you gave everyone a good teaser. It's yeah. like the perfect amount to be like okay now I need to go <laughs> seek right, some right. comfort for myself. <laughs> And I think one of the questions that someone asked me goes actually pretty much hand in hand with goals because they were talking about progress monitoring. Mm -hmm. For me, like for me, I language sample for all of my kids, yeah. but it sounds like for this particular population, language sampling as your means of progress monitoring is like, I mean, not only gold standard for everyone, but like that is the way to go. Yep, that's, that's it. it. It's really the only way to assess these kids at all accurately. Um, it's pretty much all I do for assessments, but same with progress monitoring. I try to language sample at least like five minutes of the session, every session, um, just to get a, a glimpse at how they're doing, but definitely for, for progress monitoring, a good language sample, but then you have to go further and um, look at every single utterance that they're doing and rate it as stage one, two, three, or four, because that's going to tell you how they're moving through the stages. Um, and then you, you want to look at if they're, for example, 50% in stage two, then it's time to start moving towards stage three, um, that kind of thing. So yeah, just paying attention to um, what stages they're using and also 
that communicative variety. Make sure they're getting a variety in there. Otherwise, you can say, oh, that's something that I need to model. They're missing commenting or they're missing um, pro uh, requesting or something like that. Um, right. Yeah. It's like the more I think about this, it's almost like the opposite of, you know, the language acquisition patterns that we typically think about where it's like instead we're going larger and they still need to have like when we're looking at kids, you know, that are just combined words, it's like in the same way, like they need a variety of different words and to be able to use them in different functions. So it's like there's a lot of similar principles, but we've got to flip our perspective with these kids just because like you said, and I mean, I don't like hardly know anything. So people take what I say with a grain of salt. <laughs> it's like, I mean, we're not going from single words to combining. It's almost, almost the reverse. Yeah. But yeah. I think it's just so interesting how there are similar principles in development along both with like the needing variety and needing, a, you know, all sorts of functions. It's mm -hmm. whether we're starting from like these whole chunks versus single words. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a good point because when you're, you know, language samples are so important with these students as well as all students, but um, that's kind of the only overlap with the language sampling is that you're looking at the communicative functions because other than that, you're not looking at MLU, you're not looking at grammar. I mean, these students don't have grammar issues because they're using whole gestalts that they've heard. Um, the grammar issues uh, come later when they're starting to learn how to really take single words and combine them. And that's like a far later stage. But um, yeah, so analyzing the, the language samples are, are different for sure. You'll have to help me. I like, I keep seeing comments. So okay, yeah, I see I one question. I didn't see any others. I think that's the only one that's came through. A parent just asked for home strategies to support language at home and in the classroom. Teacher shared that sentence starters have not been helpful. Um, I mean, if, is the student a gestalt processor? Um, if so, I mean, home strat this home strategy can be used for any student, but just narrating your day, you know, just talking to your child, talking out loud, um, getting that modeling in is the biggest thing that parents can do and um, pretty easy for parents to do. Sentence starters won't work for these students because they're not those mitigable phrases unless, I mean, yeah, usually sentence starters are like, I see or I want, um, which doesn't work for these students because they just kind of get stuck on those um, phrases and you can't turn them into much else. But um, yeah, I would say for parent strategies, just respond to whatever the child's saying, repeat it back to them, respond to it in some way, and then just keep modeling. It sounds like a lot of the things that you've talked about, especially like with parents being able to be personal about what they model codes are, I feel like there, no modeling is probably going to hurt. But when you can be intentional about certain models, like I'm sure it wouldn't be hard for a parent for us to say something like you say, like let's, like that phrase, is, let's narrate using let's phrases. Yeah, I feel like that's a fairly easy thing for a parent to do. Think, okay, instead of say, you know, going to the bathtub or time for the bath, just say, let's, you know, mm -hmm. to, it's not a huge change to what maybe they're already doing, but it's something intentional that could make a big difference. Definitely. Yeah, if you have the means to provide the parent with that list of great starter phrases for mitigable phrases, yeah, that can go a long way. That was a good question, or that was yeah. a good question, comment. Yeah. Sports casting, that's also a good description of <laughs> our lives. Yep, love that. I love it. Do you have another question on your list? Yeah. Um, someone asked, how do we monitor? I should have written down the questions because I just have them in my phone, but I'm trying to remember. I think someone asked, how do we um, monitor progress in stage one? Um, so that kind of goes along with the goals that I listed, but um, just you want to uh, keep track of the amount of mitigable gestalts that they're producing, the amount and the variety. And that's how you know that they're progressing in that stage one is that they're moving from just those um, gestalts that they have in their repertoire originally that may be less mitigable 
uh, to more amenable gestalts, um, if that makes sense. It sounds like with a lot of these things, because I don't want to say it's new. I feel like in terms of all of the things people have talked about, it's fairly new to people. And so maybe because there isn't as much on it, like, you know, you could go get, I mean, I'm not saying gold banks are always good, but a lot of things have gold banks where this may not. And it's like, this might take some trial and error. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like with all kids, we trial and error, right? But especially when we have to rely a little bit more on the information we do have and then make clinical decisions by ourselves, like it's okay to trial and error. If one of the goals you wrote didn't work, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, goal writing's hard with these kids just because it's new, like you said, but you can keep it pretty general, which is nice um, and makes it easier because it's hard to know how a student's going to progress when you're giving them the kind of language stimulation that they need. So, um, you know, if your goal is just they'll produce a variety of mitigable gestalts, it's um, easy to track, but it's not very limiting or, you know, it's pretty open. Exactly. Love it. I'm like trying to figure out so that we don't like talk for longer than we want to. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm <laughs> whatever. When you're ready to like be done. Okay, but um, let's see. There were a couple of questions I thought were interesting. Someone asked me about Gestalt language processing and like AAC. Do you know anything about that? Literally, just said Gestalt language processing and AAC? Question mark. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly what the question is. But yeah, I'm slowly learning. I think everyone's slowly learning. It's it's like a recent topic within the past few months. Um. I have a couple students on my caseload that I was like excited at the beginning of the year because they use AAC. I mean, they have AAC devices, but they haven't used them or made really any progress with them. And they've had them for a couple of years. And then I heard them, you know, scripting and I was like, oh, I know how to work with these kids. This is going to be great. But over the past few months, they really haven't picked up my models. Um, they still just kind of script to, to themselves it feels like they you know they talk they do their gestalts all day long but it doesn't seem to be directed towards me or a communication partner usually um and they haven't picked up models that i give them so now i'm looking to try to change their aac to be more um conducive to their language learning style um so basically uh in the conversations that I've had with people about this and um, there's also a Facebook group about this um, I, something called Gestalt language processing in AAC or something like that I'll look right now but um, lots of people are just figuring it out so they're sharing like this is what I did to change Prolico to be more of a Gestalt processing um, type device and lots of people are sharing that kind of thing and their ideas um, but basically the biggest takeaways I've had are that these kids if they're still in the initial stages of um, natural language acquisition then they need some gestalts on their AAC devices so those let's it's I'm phrases as well um, it might be beneficial to put like direct clips from movies or TV shows that they're scripting from. Um, lots of my, two of my kids script from the Backyardigans and um, <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, find what specific part this phrase is that they're using so I can take a video of it and put it into their device so then they can use that um, whenever they want it. Um, that kind of thing. I think the, the intonation of the uh, phrases is really important. So if you can find a an app where you can record the voice instead of it just being the computer read voice it's going to be helpful um but there's so many things to consider with this and there's no research on it so it's um really trial and error but um the facebook group is called aac and gestalt language processing um and uh, lots of slps are sharing a lot of great stuff in there and then, um, yeah, someone said, is there a stage of Gestalt where AAC phases out? No, if anything, it phases more in. It's um, like AAC that we 
think about with the single words becomes more and more accessible because these Gestalt language processors move into the stages where they can access single words and build sentences using single words. And then those AAC devices that we typically think about um, will be more appropriate for them. Sure, they can phase out of AAC if they're using oral speech just fine and don't need it. Um, but then they probably didn't need it at the at the start because most of these kids are really verbal um, without AAC. So, but yeah. I love that. Yeah, so it's something I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> over, over Thanksgiving break, I bring in two kids' devices home and I'm gonna go to town on them and see what I can do, but I'm definitely not an AAC programming expert, so we'll see how that goes. Perfect. My son is super drawn to ASL, and I try to encourage and use it together with spoken word. Yeah. I, I am big on multimodal communication. I'm yeah. down with that. <laughs> yep. Pretty much every goal I write is student will use total communication, what, signs, pictures, words, whatever they want. Yeah. Any thoughts on any connection to Gestalt? Um, the use of a ASL doesn't really um, tell me that the student would be a Gestalt processor or not. Um, are they using longer phrases um, and have it used single words? Um, do they seem like they're stuck on those single words maybe? Um, those are different, those are more indications I think that answers one of the other qu general questions that was on my list. I have a lot, have a lot of people that said, I think my kid is a default language processor. How, how could I know? And I think you just yeah. the key indicators. Yeah. I mean, some of my assault language processors don't even really use um, phrases yet, but they just sing or have like very uh, – Intonation is a big one. So are, is your student using a lot of um, varied intonation, whether they're intelligible or not, whether they just sing? Um, I have a good salt processor who just sings right now. He doesn't use um, like phrases. Um, so that's a big indication. Um, yeah, if your student is um, saying phrases from a TV show or movie and um, didn't go through that normal process that we would expect kids to go to, through, like one word and then two words and then three words. That's an indication. Um, what else? I just wrote a post about this. I was <laughs> post. If we don't cover it all here, I'm sure we can. I'm I'm starting to make a list. She has a post on this. We'll put. story. <laughs> she has a post on this. Yeah, I I'm gonna share a post on. Um, signs of gestalt processing tomorrow so um just look out for that and it'll explain it better I love that. um yeah my son memorized and scripted entire videos yeah your son's a gestalt processor <laughs> for sure um i don't know how old they are or how they've progressed with that but yeah sounds, sounds like it i think we had another question that was how do you help parents understand the importance of playing to these kids' strengths? Um, I think, hmm, yeah, that's tricky. Um, I mean, with this kind of therapy, the only thing that, the only input that students need is modeling. So it's just strength-based in its nature because, and, and play-based in its nature because we just need to be modeling language and we can do that um, so much more successfully when we're following the child's lead and playing with toys and things that they like. Um, so it's, it's very much less structured than like any other therapy that I've done. Um, so it can be very different for parents because they're maybe expecting tabletop work or things that they've seen done before. So it can be an adjustment. Um, but I think when they see the progress that that makes all the difference and just, you know, trying to explain that, that importance of that modeling for them. But I don't know if you have any ideas on that. But. 
disagree. I think the thing that also underlies all of that and that leads to exactly what you said, which I totally agree with, is I think once the parent can come to understand that the way this child is developing language is different than most kids that you probably already know. And because that, pro you know, that development is different, we need to do something different. I think parents are usually like, oh, so tell me what I need to do. Because, you know, with every other kid, it's like, these are your know, generic things that we tell parents to do when a kid, you know, just progresses through like, single words, and then combining words. But if the parents really understand that the developmental trajectory of their child, if it is, you know, a gestalt language processor, then I feel like the natural reaction is, oh, so what do I need to do that's different? And then that would lead exactly to what you said about just like modeling and modeling and basically everything you just said. So that's my only two cents that I would add. When they understand the why, then exactly what you said. The yeah. natural, I would think. Yeah, I love that. Um, people are saying someone asked floor time. Or are you asking if that's a good um, model? I, I, I don't know, as far as working with Gestalt processors, um, I'm not sure. I know that it's a very like neurodiversity affirming model, um, strength-based model. I don't know exactly um, what it entails. Um, but as far as working with Gestalt processors, I don't think, I mean, that's not what it's aimed at. So I'm not sure how that would um, work together, but it's a great model for other students. Um, Someone said it sounds a lot like Montessori by following the child's lead and modeling in the natural environment. Yeah, they would definitely pair well together, yeah. Perfect. These, these are like good comments and good questions, people. This is fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone asked me about immediate echolalia and mm -hmm. what to do with it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of Gestalt processors may also use immediate echolalia, which just means they're directly imitating what you said or what they heard instead of um, delayed echolalia, which is um, more what we work with um, when it comes to the natural language acquisition process. So immediate echolalia, we don't really work with it. It's not part of the natural language acquisition process, um, but we still want to acknowledge it. Um, it has a purpose. Maybe they're repeating what they heard because they're trying to process it or maybe think of um, what to say. Um, or perhaps um, they don't understand your question, so they're repeating it because they don't have better um, response. Um, for example, I I greet one of my Gestalt processing students with his name and he just repeats that back to me because um, he doesn't yet understand that he's supposed to say, hi, Miss K. Um, so in that instance, I'll just model the response that I'm looking for. I'll just say, if he doesn't give me that, then I'll say, hi, Miss K. And then he repeats, hi, Miss K. And um, now after a couple of weeks of that, he greets me um, with my name. So um, in those instances, it's not really... Um, the like mitigable phrases that we want to focus on modeling, but when those in instances come up, it's totally fine, and I think, to model what you think they would want to respond with. Um, but that's kind of why we want to avoid those questions, um, like WH questions, because those students, consult processors in the early stages can't yet answer those um, reliably. So they don't really do much for their development. Instead, we just want to focus on modeling um, those medical phrases. Um, but that's where I've seen echolalia, immediate echolalia come up a lot is when the student doesn't have a script to respond to you yet. So they're just imitating what you say. I love that. Oh, that's always my, and I'm, I am by no means a pro at any kind of echolalia, but that's typically what I do with my kiddos have a lot of immediate echolalia is first acknowledge because the fact that they wrote you know said anything at all is communication whether it was intentional completely or not and then like you said model yeah. that's all acknowledge model acknowledge model that's all <laughs> that's all I do every day <laughs> yep but I think it's a safe and simple effective way to handle it acknowledge yeah. model Someone's like, can you have both immediate and delayed? Yeah, um, I think most of my, if not all of my Gestalt processors use both. Um, delayed is just 
having those phrases that are delayed are what's gonna turn into more um, language down the line, but, or what we can work with anyways. Exactly. Yeah. I actually had a question that someone said, what if they only have immediate echolalia? They don't see any delayed yet. And I was like, I don't know that I have a good answer for this. I mean, we could talk it out, but I don't know that I have a direct good answer for this kid only currently does immediate echolalia. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't come across that. Um, I would say just keep focusing on modeling, modeling, modeling those mitigable phrases, but... Um, it's something to ask in the, the Facebook group, I bet Marge or um, the other members would have better comments on that. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's a good thing. Now, now, now when I figure out too, now I'm like, I don't know the answer. So I feel like I need to go to the Facebook group and ask <laughs> better than me. Yeah, it's helpful. And I love how Facebook groups, if you, you can just search for a key term and it'll pop up with all the conversations that have already happened about that term. I do it all the time with goals in that group or just child specific things. And it's usually already been addressed. So you don't even have to be the one to ask the question and wait for an answer either. That's awesome. Any connection with dual language households and this whole processing? I'm still learning about the brain or what you're, um, being bilingual wouldn't, um, like make you a gestalt processor or not. Um, you're born one way or the other so um no I don't as far as working with bilingual gestalt processors um I don't have experience with that but I I guess you would just model those mitigable phrases in both languages um but I, that's just my guess um that's what seems intuitive to me but that's another question that could be asked in the Facebook group um yeah okay. that'd be interesting about like diverse populations or like ELL kids. So essentially the same thing. It's like, is there any research on this? And I was like, I'll bet you maybe a little bit, but there may be none at all. Yeah. <laughs> Someone wants to decide to do some research. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Now I'm curious. Yeah. And I'm, like keeping a running list of no answer. Let's figure out if there is an answer. And if not, let's find someone who's willing to do the research on it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That reminds me, someone asked me, um, who can be a gestalt processor? Um, and it's mainly autistic people. Um, but it can be anyone. Um, non autistic people are also um, gestalt processors. The biggest um, difference is that our autistic students are the ones who usually get stuck in the early stages. And this is for a variety of reasons. One being their, just their um, speech develops later often due to motor um, reasons. So um, with that, so with, with students who don't have those motor issues and are talking at one years old, they might move through those stages of natural language acquisition so quickly that we don't even know what happens and they're already self-generated language. Um, so we don't even, we never even knew that they were processing language in a different way. But when our students get stuck in those initial stages and they're older, then it starts to stand out to us. And that's usually our autistic students 75% of autistic students are gestalt processors. So, and that's why I'm so like, this is so important to me because 75% of our autistic students need this kind of therapy. Um, so yeah, but it can be anyone who is a gestalt processor. It's just, that. yeah. And I think that's all the questions that I got in my box. I was gonna say, I see someone and Someone asked a question here that goes along with something else that someone asked me. So how to introduce a gestalt processor to a new speech therapist to see if there would be a good fit. There's that question and it kind of goes along with one of mine that says, how would I know, you know, how could I find a professional? Mm. <laughs> and I think a lot of people have asked that. <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as finding a speech therapist, the only, um, like, I don't know the term database of speech of speech therapists who follow this method are in the meaningful speech community. So if you join that community, you can ask in there and they will tag like all the speech therapists who are in your area. Um, 
I know I get tagged in that. Um, maybe you could just reach out to Alexandria at Meaningful Speech and she'll be able to, I mean, you can reach out to me and I can ask in the community. Um, but other than that, I would just call your local SLPs that come up when you Google them in your area and ask if they're familiar with natural language acquisition. Um, and then if they are, I guess, um, as far as seeing if they're a good fit, um, that just takes some trial and error. I, I think if you're following the natural language acquisition process and actually doing, you know, play-based child-led therapy, it's hard to not be a good fit because if you're just playing with a kid's favorite toys, they're, it's going to be hard for them not to like you, I think. Um, but you never know. So, yeah, it's always okay to, to do some trial periods. And if it's not a good fit, there's other therapists. But I agree. And I am going to add one thing, and I can only speak on behalf of myself, but I'm going to assume that there are other SLPs that feel this way. If I was an SLP who just happened to not know much or anything at all about, you know, natural language position, I would, if a parent came to me and said, are you familiar with the approach? This is, you know, what I know about it. It looks like this would be helpful for my child. And if the, if the speech therapist said, no, but let me look at it. I would appreciate that as a professional because I'll be the first to say there's so much always going on in the field that I can't be up to date on everything. And so sometimes the first time I hear about something new or, you know, that has recently come out is from a parent. And so I appreciate personally and professionally when a parent will bring those things to me so I can develop personally because I might not know. Them. Yeah. But also add that, don't be afraid to, and some people may not be as willing to learn new things. But I think most people, I hope they would. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Because yeah, our field is so broad and we're, we, none of us know all of the, the strategies. Um, and it is such a new thing that most SLBs don't know the strategy yet. So you might not find someone in your area that like lists it under their specialties. Um, it's probably harder to find than you think. So yeah definitely ask and introduce it to your speech therapist or um, a speech therapist that you can find that's available. Um, I know personally a family that I nanny for, um, I was like, your kid is a gestalt processor. Here's what that is. And they have already been seeing a speech therapist. So um, she brought it up to the speech therapist and they've been doing the meaningful speech courses together and it's been going really well. So yeah, um, it's something that is very nuanced and there's a lot to it, but the basics of it are pretty easy to pick up and start using right away. So I think any speech therapist who's willing to learn about it could do it um, for sure um, in a pretty short amount of time if they're willing to, to learn, so. Um, and even, even if I can't figure out immediately, I would still appreciate a parent bringing it up so that I can start that process. Cause if no one ever brings it to my attention, then that process is never going to start. So yeah, definitely. always 10 out of 10 recommending, suggesting things to your speech therapist. Yeah. yeah professional you're working with. <sighs> okay. You originally said 30 minutes and we're at 45. So <laughs> we can. Probably... It's fine. It's gone so fast. <laughs> That's how I usually feel. I usually tell people, oh, you know, 30 minutes and we're like at an hour and then we're at like eight <laughs> like, sorry if you had other plans tonight. Nope, not me. No, this is great. Yeah. Um, I hope I'm not missing any questions that were sent to me. Do you have more? Let's see. We hit. I think we hit all of them, whether we explicitly went over the question or just discussed it. So I think we're good. And I kept a list of a lot of the Facebook groups or resources that you've talked about. So I made a list. And now that everyone will, you have 10K followers, so you could have linked previously. But now that I can link, because I don't have 10K followers, I'll link some stuff and you can link on your page as well. But anything we've talked about yeah. today. Okay. We'll, so it's easily accessible. Yeah, I'll try to add some links in my story too. I hit that 10K like 
right when I also got links just when everyone else did. So I was like, what do I get now? <laughs> right. It's a, it's a nice feature. It is. Well, this has been so fun. I mean, if you think of anything before we like wrap up, that you're like, wait, people need to know this right now. You can add it. But if not, I feel like we've done a pretty good job of giving people a pretty good beginner's overview and taste. Yeah. I'm just all processing. Yeah, if anyone has other questions, if not, um, as far as resources, I'll share in my story a post that I just made about them. But um, Mar anything by Marge Blanc is great because she did so much of the, the research in this and really revolutionized the, the therapy approach that goes along with echolalia. So anything by Marge Blanc is great. Her book, Natural Language Acquisition on the Autism Spectrum, is great. Don't buy it on Amazon, buy it on Northern Speech Services, and it's like a third of the price. Um, that is good information. Yeah. Um, and then Meaningful Speech, um, which is her Alex um, Zacha's Instagram handle, but also she has a website that is currently um, waitlisted, but it'll be opening up soon. And that's where I've learned so much of my information. It's, it's parent friendly as well. So I recommend it to parents and it's uh, a monthly subscription right now. So um, it's more affordable because you can cancel anytime, um, but it's really great. Um, yeah, so I'll share that, that post if people want more information and links and whatnot. Um, yeah. Perfect, I think people will love that. I think people love that listening to things like this and then being like, okay, <laughs> they go to stories and they're like, there's all the links I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's really important to share about it. But I think we did a good job. I think we did. And if you are sitting in bed tonight and realize, oh my goodness, I forgot to say something important, that's why we have stories. <laughs> you can, I always do that after my lives. I'm like, oh, here's a thought that I didn't share. So, yeah. Or this has been really fun. This will be recorded on my profile and then I'm gonna show Katya how to download it so she can upload it on her profile too. So it's accessible to both. Awesome. Well, and thanks. It was nice to chat with you and meet yeah. you for real. You too. And I think most people that are maybe still here or will be listening probably already follow you, but if not, you can find her at, at Boho Speechy. Thanks. Speechy IE. Why? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, perfect. In that case, go give your dog some love <laughs> now that I've taken you away from your dog and have an awesome rest of your week. You too. Thanks so much. See you later. Bye.